Welcome to the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Danny Kennedy, and I'm here to help you become the very best version of yourself. What's up, guys? Welcome back to yet another episode of the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast. Um, today, I'm joined by a really exciting guest, and I'm really um, interested in the conversation we're going to have today. Um, and I'm very appreciative of the fact that she is joining me. So I'm joined by Ruby Fuss. So Ruby, th- uh, thank you for joining me today um, and, and welcome to the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast. No, thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. So for everyone who's listening or um, watching the interview at the moment, um, Ruby is currently serving in the Australian Defence Force. Um, uh, so there's plenty of stuff I want to cover uh, in our conversation today. Um, but second to that, which is also um, what really grabbed my attention, is that Ruby currently um, helps people who are, who are looking to get into the Defence Force. So physically and mentally, I love the fact that it's mental as well as physical, which I'm sure we'll touch on at some point today. Um, so how about we get stuck into it, Ruby? Do you want to tell us a little bit about, um, I guess, before we get into the, the PT side of things, um, mm-hmm. your own journey in the Australian Defence Force and how, I guess, that came about in the first place? Yeah, so I initially signed up for the ADF gap year because I had no idea what I wanted to do at uni. And like, you know, in high school, they're like, oh, what are you going to do at uni? And I was like, I have no clue. (laughs) So then my other option was, oh, I'll go cops. And then speaking to um, small country town cops, they're like, go and get some life experience first. And one of them was like, oh, I was in the army for a couple of years. Maybe you should do that. So I was like, oh, Roger that. Okay, sweet. That'll (laughs) that'll do. So signed up for the um, ADF gap year um, in artillery air defense, which I um, ended up staying in for four years up until just recently. Um, But sort of right from the get go, started off, went through Kapuka, um went through my initial employment training which is the training that you do for your job um and while i was physically prepared for kapuka i did a lot of boxing um sports and all that before i joined so i had a really good aerobic base um and then moving on to employment training becomes a little bit more physical especially um heading into artillery which is um a combat support course so um, a, a lot more physically demanding than um, some others. So heading into there, I was rudely awakened to my level of fitness and conditioning um, in that space. Are you able to give um, us, um, just, just to cut you off, are you able to give us an idea of like, say, some of the physical work that went into, you know, the first stages in your, your initial time there and then the, how much of a jump there was between, I guess, some mm. of the physical capabilities that you needed to have, mm. which, which was such a shock for you? Yeah, so during um, your basic training, it's um, a lot of like your basic soldiering skills. So um, you're running, being able to scale obstacles, um, carry um, like weight load um, through packs and body armor and being able to do that um, under fatigue. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the next jump up from that is especially going into your more um, combat roles and combat support roles is the next level up in terms of load carriage, um, the endurance that you need to be able to carry those loads under, Mm -hmm. and then also the tasks that you have to do under fatigue. So there's a lot of firing and movement when you think of um, uh, when you do a section attack or something like that or your... um, you know, moving from one location to the other and you have to have all your stores with you. So you've got that other level of conditioning that you need. Okay. So there are a lot of roles where you're carrying up to even twice your body weight. So, you know, uh-huh. yeah, jumping from probably anywhere between 15 to 25 kilos to then going from 35 to 40 kilos. Like it's a, it's a very big jump and yeah. I'm a midget. Like I'm five <laughs> foot nothing. So <laughs> um, like when I put a pack on, it's like you, you see a pack and legs. So um <laughs> So yeah, there's, yeah, literally it was, it, (laughs) um, yeah, it's the pack to me ratio is insane. Um, so yeah. And then also just like the jump in the aerobic capacity and the strength that you need, um, in those movements as well. Cause you do quite a bit of like running, bounding, jumping, scaling obstacles and all that, like in body armor. So there's just that huge jump and even going from civvy street to, um, military in general, there's, still a huge gap in in that area okay. because you think about um, pre-enlistment standards being the push-up, sit-ups and the beep test run. Um, that is the minimum standard that you are required to be at 
to be able to even conduct training through basic training and then onto your employment training. Okay. But it's, um, it's not really like enough. Mm. In my opinion, you think, especially uh, yeah, I was going to say like, even, even I've found, um, you know, and for some people who probably haven't ever trained before and, and whatnot, then obviously some of these, these basic tests are going to be difficult enough, but it seems, it seems odd to me, even like in the, the police force, I find like the, the, um, barrier to entry or whatever it is, like the early, early physical testing seems like almost mm. outrageously simple. Yeah. Um, to the point where it's like, you know, if you're it, to, compared to what they're, they're probably going to have to do or, or may have to do at some point in time, mm. like when they're actually out in the field, you'd think that it'd be like uh, a little bit, bit, a little bit more advanced or a bit more difficult. Um, mm. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so then you you moved on to to um to the next chapter and and you and you found it a little bit more difficult. So um, what was kind of like the process then in terms of what did you do? I guess to to actually level up physically and mentally as far as to to be able to account for the increase in in, in the physical output and whatnot. We're very we're very fortunate that we have our physical training instructors who. Um, it is that they specialize in physically and mentally preparing us uh, for these like these physical um, requirements of our trade of our job um, and all that sort of stuff so you go as part of your course you go through um, a PT program and ha that has progressive weight load like marches um, and other sessions on top of that as well so we have that structured training for it as well and then yep. also what I neglected especially at the start was going on and doing a bit of my further training and focusing like i didn't focus on my weak points okay. which in the end was to my detriment because i did end up injuring my back um okay. so and that in itself was a huge huge journey for me and it's um part of the reason why i'm so passionate about what i do now is going through that experience because anyone who's had an injury knows just like mentally how much it can set you back like yeah. you know you you miss going out and training you're limited in what you can do you just want to get back into it but you've got this thing that's restricting you so that can play on your mind as well yeah so then i had quite a bit uh, quite a lot of mental growth through that and i have like a lot to thank from the physical training instructors um and also like my own mindset work to try and work through that um as well but then also when it comes to our sort of training as well the mental aspect and knowing the way that you think and approaching a task with a strong mindset is going to is sometimes the difference between you being able to complete the session or um complete the task as opposed to um not being able to mm. but i guess like yeah swinging back to um that process um what i neglected needed to be like I needed to go back and actually do a little it. bit extra. Yeah, yeah. And address that because it's what set me back ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, but in saying that, like, you know, we're resilient people. We look at, it's about looking at those um, experiences and being like, okay, what can I do with that experience now? How can I learn from that? And mm -hmm. how can I um, grow from that and be able to help others as well? But then also how can I take that further on in my career? Um, so yeah, eventually um, I was able to rehab my back, um, got back up to the standard to be able to pass the um, fitness test that I had to to complete that, which involved a ten kilometer pack march, um, which was uh, roughly between thirty five to forty kilos. So at the time, that was more than half my body weight. Yeah, right. Um, so it's like a pre fatiguing exercise for um, a bit of fire movement afterwards. Um, leopard crawling, which is literally just like you just send it across the ground. Um, in kind of layman's terms. And then um, you do a bit of a stores carry um, and then a box lift. So it's a bit okay. of an accumulative event. Um, so you pass that and then you go into your unit and you're able to go into your trade. And then um, it's a requirement that um, we do PT um, at least four times a week. Um, and that's just part of like a structured um, PT program you do with your unit, um, which is like, which is really, really fun. And that just, again, creates just the foundation of fitness that you need to be able to do your job but then yeah there's the onus on that you need to also be doing stuff in your own time to um work on those weaknesses and get yourself up to a standard unreal so now kind of take us to like where, at what point did you um so i'm assuming like uh, in terms of like training people now um to to physically and mentally be ready like when did you decide that that was something that you wanted to do um separately i guess to just your, your regular duties or, or as part of the defence force? Like when was that a decision that you made that like, I want to also 
um, on the side or, or as, as a main point of focus to really help other people go through like what I've already, already been through? It was actually a conversation that I was having um, with one of my friends because they asked about the whole experience of like when I did my back and the whole like how did you get through it because they were injured at the time and sort of the way that like we spoke about it and I sort of gave the methods that I used to get through that just in an attempt to help them and it was sort of something that sparked in my head then that I was sort of like I really want to help people get through that as well and initially um it was sort of just more about helping people in general um and then sort of when I saw that there was um a bit more of a gap between people who wanted to enlist and like going from that fitness to um then going to, you know, having that huge jump, Mm. I was like, you know, something needs to be done here because I don't want people to be injured the way that I was and then have to go through, you know, all that journey to, you know, get where um, I am today. So definitely like bridging that gap. So it wasn't, I guess, like one defining moment, but it was definitely that conversation that sparked it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it was just about going on and doing all of my certifications and all that sort of stuff as well. So how does that work? Is that so, so the business you're running now, the the PT side of things, is that as part of the Australian Defence Force or is this like separate, like is your own business um, outside of the Defence Force or is this kind of like in collaboration? Uh, so it's my own business, cool. um, just on the side, but um, within um, the Defence Force now, I'm a physical training instructor. Awesome. Um, so because of the impact that they had on me during that experience as well, I've recently transitioned from artillery into being a physical training instructor as well. So, yeah, um, yeah I work like day to day with enlisted members um, to like running PT, running fitness assessments yep. and helping them in the same way. Fantastic. So in terms of... Um in the artillery side of things what would you say um would be i guess the let's say three of like the main um physical capabilities that are that are needed to be able to i guess excel in that area i mean like specific um physical capabilities is it like um anaerobic fitness is it being able to push past a lactate threshold is it um, having strong glutes so you don't injure your back like what what are three things that you think are, are really important in that aspect i think first and foremost you need to have a really good aerobic base yep. because the aerobic base is what's going to help you um be able to go the distance have the endurance um and all that sort of stuff. and it's going to help and carry on to your weight training and all that as well mm. um then you need to be able to lift heavy shit like yep. <laughs> that like that's as basic as it gets really like there's some heavy shit that you have to carry over you know and like, I don't want to say endless kilometers, but for you yeah, know, yeah. quite a long yeah. time. Yeah. So being able to lift heavy shit, being able to lift it under fatigued state, because you're not always going to be fresh. So mm. learning to have the spatial awareness like of your body and being able to lift correctly, correctly yeah. um, to um, mitigate that risk of injury. Um, and then, yeah, having, and the third part is having that base of strength, especially like your lower limb, um, both anterior yeah. and posterior um having that as well to one protect your back from injuries but it also being on your feet a lot as well like you want to um, protect your knees your ankles yeah. your feet um prevent stress fractures um and all that sort of stuff so yeah i'd say being able to, to have a really good aerobic base mm-hmm. um lift heavy shit yeah and do it correctly <laughs> um so they're having that foundation of strength as well yeah right so I think as well, like for anyone listening or watching, like um, obviously we're specifically talking about um, the Defence Force at the moment, but I mean, it's it's so true in regards to just life in general. I mean, it's great. One of the coolest things I find working with clients, I'm sure you'd find the same thing, is that, um, you know, for someone who has no real intention to play a sport or to to go into the Defence Force or to do powerlifting or anything crazy like that, it's it's literally just because they want to be physically and mentally fit and healthy. Um, one of the coolest bits of feedback I get is simple stuff like, you know, um, it might be a female that I'm working with that comes and says, you know, I was at work and, um, you know, I was the only one that I was the only one that was able to lift this box off like a shelf or um, I had to carry like fucking all the groceries in at the same time, whatever it is, like the everyday stuff, um, the amount of stuff that we do on a day-to-day basis that is not specifically strength training, but you have to use strength to do it. Um, you find the benefits of that once you do increase your, your overall strength and, and the aerobic capacity as well, like just being able to recover quicker between sessions and whatnot is so important. 
Um, I had, uh, I was fortunate enough to have a chat with um, Mark Wales on the show uh, last year, I think it was. Yeah. He was formerly SAS. And um, mm-hmm. one of the things I found really intriguing was the mental side of things. And I know you mentioned you, you do a bit of work with the, the mental side of things as well. So yeah. earlier in the chat, you did mention, um, you know, some of the practices or techniques you're able to use to help with their mental resilience or the sh- mental capacity side of stuff. What type of, um, I guess, tools have you added to your toolkit to be able to improve on the mental side of things? Um, One of them especially, and I've done it ever since I was a kid, so I'm very fortunate to already have that habit, was journaling. Um, And in that process, like, you really get down, because once you start, like, free-flowing with journaling, you get to a place and your thoughts just flow. So you can start to identify where the problem is and where it lies to then be able to um, work to fix it. Mm -hmm. And in this particular case, when I sort of realized that, you know, I was like scared, I wasn't strong enough, um, I was sick of being a victim, I found that I was falling into a lot of like a bit of a victim mentality. Yep, which is super Um, common in in general population, yeah. yeah. And then taking ownership, like learning um, and evolving through ownership, like taking ownership of your actions, taking ownership of your thoughts, and then being able to trap the negative thoughts as soon as they come up. So, um, and I say to my clients, as soon as a negative thought comes up about either your performance, your body, or something that you're doing, literally in your head, just yell stop. Mm -hmm. Because that's going to stop that train of thought right away. And you're going to be like, okay, is that thought, is that or this action, or this thought process, is this going to serve me in this moment? Is it going to make me a better person? Is it going to, um, is it going to pull me out of alignment with my goals, or mm-hmm. so on and so forth? I think as and well, then, the, other, the, other, the other part of that as well is, is it actually true? Um, yeah. That's one thing I can't remember who I heard, who I heard it, or read it, or where I read it, sorry. Um, but it was like, you know, you, like your thoughts aren't always true. Most of the time they're not. So it's like it's just a matter of literally just thinking like is the thought I'm having an actual fact yeah. or is it just something that I'm just thinking about that I'm making myself believe is true, which is, which can often which often it is not true. It is just That's a it. thought about either the future or, or or something that hasn't even happened yet. And we're all our own like we're all our own worst critics as well. Like it's we're human at the end of the day. We're all going to have thoughts that come up like that. Um, the difference I think comes is learning over time how to stop those thoughts and change that narrative, change that narrative to something that's positive, positive. Even if you don't believe it in that moment, changing Mm -hmm. that narrative to believe that it's positive um, will have like ends effect as you like go forward. Cause I I remember especially pack marching, like pack marching isn't comfortable. Like a lot of the time you have to get used to being like, we say get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, So like sort of trying to think of an analogy here, like through pack marching, like, it hurts like sometimes like you know physically like your your traps are sore your feet are sore everything's burning yeah um and all that sort of stuff but it's like like you know can i still walk yeah i can still walk like you know yeah. everything's going to be okay like you know all i've got to do is keep walking so sort of changing that narrative from like oh yeah my traps are a little bit sore it's sitting a little bit funny but it's like yeah that's all well and good but you can still go like mm, everything's still going to be okay your mind tends to give up a lot sooner than what your physical body ever would um, Absolutely. Yeah, if you if you can kind of block that out. I mean, I'm sure you've seen some of his content and consumed a bit of it. But I mean, David Goggins is someone mm-hmm. that I think a lot of people would probably be familiar with, and you know, just listening Absolutely. to him. I mean, obviously, he's on a very extreme end of the spectrum, but um, in regards to mental toughness and resilience, but mm-hmm. a lot of the stuff he says is so true. Like, even you know, people can use it even to their own degree. It's just like you, can, mm-hmm. you can't always listen to that little voice in your head. Sometimes you just got to tell it to go away and block it out and, and just yeah. get on with it. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, right. So yeah. that's interesting. So for someone that's listening at the moment or, or even if they're not listening at the moment, like what what is, I guess, the pathway for someone that wants to get in to the defence force? And I guess like how soon and, and how, uh, I guess, that's the word I'm trying to think of, how, how much of a commitment do they need to be making, I guess, to the physical side of things and mental, like prior to even trying to sign up or, or, or once they're actually signed up to, to start the journey? Well, the journey itself, it, it differs from person to person. Like uh, you can talk to everyone. Everyone's had a different experience in coming in in terms of time frame and all that sort of stuff. And my advice would be as soon as you're thinking of joining, start thinking about your fitness because you can never be too fit to join. And mm. what you're doing now is going to benefit you so much more in the long run. 
Um, so that's like definitely my first um, thing of advice. And then the process um, isn't always linear either. Um, so always stick it out. If it's something that you're really passionate about and you really want to do, definitely stick with the process. Um, and then, uh, sorry, what was the other part of the question? Is I guess how much of a commitment. So let's say, for example, right now you're, you're working with a, a client of yours who mm -hmm. wants to join the Defence Force or they want to go into artillery or whatever, like what like how much of a commitment like how i mean it's going to it's going to be vary from person to person but mm -hmm. as a base level like how much per week like what does a typical week look like in terms of how the structure they're training is like yeah again individual dependent um especially depending on their current fitness levels um and also the time frame to um when they have to conduct their fitness assessment mm -hmm. but at least a minimum of three days so at least two weight sessions um and a cardio session but then again if um sort of we need to work more on the beep test sort of side of things we'll um sort of switch that around a little bit and put a lot more emphasis on the training but then breaking it into blocks as well so focusing on one thing in one block and one thing in the other. So the commitment um, weekly is at least um, three sessions a week. Yep. Um, but then also as part of um, our weekly check-ins as well, I get them to have a reflection on their week. Um, and also if they've, um, you know, done like a little bit of mindfulness, if there's anything that's coming up that, you know, we need to um, talk about as well. Um, and then from the mental side of things, a lot of it comes with experience and being exposed to different situations, like a lot of growth. Um, and I remember at my enlistment day, someone saying you won't be the same person now they, than you are at the end of, say, your basic training and your employment yeah. training. And it is so true yeah. because you learn so much about what you're capable of during those times because like you know you're put in uncomfortable situations and you learn how you react and how you respond. And then you know you go from that your comfort zone to the growth zone. So, you know, you've got your like your little comfort bubble yeah. and then you're pushed out of that a little bit and you're like, okay, I can grow from this experience and then therefore your comfort bubble is even bigger. Yeah. Um, the base level continues to, to mm. increase and get higher and higher as, as a base. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah. And then individual dependent, if people have more time um, to commit, we'll look at um, also doing that as well. And then if they want to play sport as well, I definitely encourage that because we play sport in the ADF as well. Um, mm -hmm. That's super, super encouraged as well. And then also like, you know, the athletic um, component of sport, building the aerobic base, that's a perfect um, part yeah. for that. And then also getting into a team sport because we harp on teamwork a lot. So, you know, already being in that team sport as well. So if they play sport as well, we incorporate that um, into their mm -hmm. program as well. Outside of the physical component and I guess even uh, outside of the physical component, like what do you think are the, um, I'll use three again, very random and pretty mm. cliche number, but what are the three, like, I guess, main skills that, that you found are super important? Like, is it, you know, is it accountability, communication? Like what, what are the three things that you think like that you can really um, point out to be super important to be successful in, in the defense force and, and with all the, the duties and, and tasks and stuff that you have to try and get through? Uh, definitely being able to be adaptable because um, mm -hmm. not every day is going to be the same. Um, things come up. So like being able to adapt and I say ad adapt it's like mm, adaptable flexibility or structured flexibility. So yep. being able to adapt to situations um, as they come on up. The go. Yep. Yeah, like you, yeah, fast thinking, fast on your feet, be, being able to be adaptable. Um, being able to use your initiative as well. Um, like, you know, being able to speak up, use your initiative, not necessarily have to be asked to do something. Um, so yeah, definitely being able to um, use your initiative and be a team player, like you, and it's it's the same pretty much in every um, job. Like you you want to you want to be a team player. You want to be able to help your mates. Um, I, like you, if you speak to anyone who's been in the defence force, and they'll say like you make friends for life, and yeah. it is such an incredible experience to go through so many different experiences with these people live with each other 24 seven, especially when you're going field, like you learn so much about each other, but the connections that you make are incredible. So yeah, being able to be a team player and, you know, being open to, you know, experiencing that, those um, situations with um, other people. Awesome. What do you think is the, uh, I guess the, the most challenging task that you've had to, to go through, like probably from both the physical and mental um, aspect? 
Um, definitely um, doing my PESA, which was um, a uh, which was that um, fitness test that I had to pass um, in order to go from my employment training to my unit. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what I had to pass after I did my back with the pack march. So that yeah. especially was quite challenging um, for me. And is, um, that, is the fitness test, um, is that like the sole test? Is it a 10, 10 kilometer um, pack march? And that's, if you can get through that, then that's a pass or is that, how does that work? So you have to pass each component. So um, you've got to pass the pack march, and then you go on to the fire and movement and the leopard call, and you have to pass that as well. Mm-hmm. Then on to the um, stores carry, you have to pass that and the box lift. So say, for example, okay. you pass the uh, the pack march, you pass the fire and movement, but you fail the uh, the stores carry, but then pass the box lift because you didn't pass the... Uh, the stores carry, you have to do the whole thing again. Okay. Is there a certain amount of times that you're allowed to try it or is there a certain amount of time you have to wait between? Uh, Yeah. So you have three attempts um, and you have six week blocks in between. So you go through a um, retraining part just to, um, which it incorporates all the components, but um, it's to better prepare you um, to reattempt it. Yeah. And to reattempt it again. Um, so yeah, that was a um, challenge for me, both like physically um, and mentally, like especially sort of um, being a smaller human, carrying that amount of weight. Um, mm. Is it just, a, is it standardized? So like you could be 50 kilos, you could be 80 kilos, you could be 100 kilos and everyone just carries the same amount? Yeah, absolutely. Because, mm. and like, and I'm a very big believer as well, like the weight's there for a reason. You need to be able to carry that weight in order to do your job. So yeah. if you can't, if you can't carry the weight, if you can't meet the standard, then like for lack of a better word, stiff shit. Yeah, because like, like yeah. yeah, you need to be able to keep up with your job it's requirements. A test for a reason. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a test there for a reason. Yeah. Um, it's a bit more standardized now, um, sort of being around the twenty five kilo mark, but it's still a requirement for everyone to be able to carry that amount of weight for the amount of distance in the amount of time. So it's standardized across the board. Um, so yeah. Like if you need to be able to, it's it's there for a reason. You need to be able to meet that standard to, you know, safely um, conduct your job. So super interesting. So where do you like? Where do you see? Um, I guess the business and yourself in say five years time from now. Like, is there is there a plan? Like, do you have a, a bit of a? Um, you have your sights set on on some form of um, I guess not destination, but is there some goals set at the moment? Are you happy? Kind of just continuing to help as many people as you can with the business and, and obviously improve yourself or do you have some big goals set for yourself? Like what does that look like? Well, I'd love to be able to help everyone. Um, so especially through um, Instagram, being able to give out information there and help people, especially through the DMs. Like even if someone just wants to shoot me a message, I get so many about, and I love hearing about people who've just enlisted or yep. they've just put in their application um, all that I love hearing about all that sort of stuff. And in terms of plans for um, the next five years, uh, definitely um, increasing the amount of um, information that I'm putting out, um, YouTube videos, more videos um, over Instagram, using Instagram TV and all that sort of stuff. And also starting to take on um, face-to-face clients as well. So I've been predominantly online um, okay, just cool. the, due to the nature of my work and transitioning through jobs. So yep. um, predominantly just online but then moving into the face-to-face um, space as well. So, awesome. yeah. Exciting times. Well, mm. I will make sure that all of um, your oh. socials and stuff are in the, in the show notes um, below. So if anyone who, who has listened or watched that um, has any questions for Ruby or, or just found certain parts of today interesting, um, first, we'd love for you to take a screenshot of the episode and share on the social media. Um, but secondly, don't hesitate to, to reach out and, and let Ruby know if there's anything that she can... Um, help you with or, or even if you're just intrigued about any stuff we talked about i'm sure she'll be happy to to answer them for you so ruby um look thank you for for joining us today it's been a, a good conversation um there's plenty of stuff that i've taken away from it and um all the best with it, it sounds like you've got a, a really good business but the mainly the most important thing it sounds like you're doing it all for the right reason so uh, i'm sure it'll be super successful hey thank you very much thank you for having me absolute pleasure um again guys thank you so much for tuning in 
Um, I really do appreciate it. And as I said, if you've enjoyed the show, it'd help out a lot. If you could screenshot the show, share on the Instagram stories, tag myself, tag Ruby. As I said, um, the links to her socials and whatnot will be in the show notes below. Um, look forward to chatting to you again in, uh, in the next episode of the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast.